thousands of gallons of milk being dumped on dairy farms across Wisconsin. The restaurants closed. We lost 50% of our sales overnight. Farmers are taking big steps in rice country to beat the coronavirus. Closer to having to make that gut-wrenching decision to euthanize some of their hogs. This is economically devastating as well as emotionally devastating to a lot of farmers. The reason why we wanted to tell this story to begin with was, was because the pork producing industry is, is a very big industry in, in Nebraska. This whole idea of pork production that we have in the United States today is so finely tuned that if there's any slight disruption in there, it backs up everything. And when pork packing plants started to shut down, there was a backup of, uh, I think they were estimated 150,000 hogs a day couldn't go to slaughter. So that creates quite a backup. Well, what happens to those pigs? Well, these producers on these farms are not finding a market to take their hogs to. Some people are in dire straits. They have no place to go with the animals and they've got to euthanize either the full uh, grown market animal or they got to euthanize the baby pigs coming in these farmers, they've got to make a decision on whether to either slaughter the whole or just euthanize. That's a lot of money that they have invested in those things or to slaughter out their kind of like their little piglets. That's their money. That's their investment as it's going up. So if they slaughter off the piglets, then they, they have a, they'll have a gap in their revenue source. So it's a tough decision when you, you run out of room and you don't have a place to put them. There's an extreme frustration there that you can hear from these these farmers as, as they're conveying some of their stories about, you know, uh, their situation. There's there's this feeling like, you know, hey, this is what we do. This is our job is to, pro to feed the nation. We've got the supply here, but we can't get it to those people that need it. We've probably got maybe two, three weeks tops before we have to start making these tough decisions. Some of these guys have 400 500, 1,000 hogs that they have to go to market right now. Some people think, well, you can just shut it off. Well, that doesn't work in the farming business. You can't just turn the switch off and, and, and because you've got these little piglets coming along. You know, eventually, if you had more time, they could slow down their production, absolutely. You know, and they've done that before. They can't just turn this thing off and then continue to stay in business once things get better. The industry as a whole is in dire straits. We need some type of uh, grants or loans or even indemnification payments if we have to uh, euthanize any animals. The pork industry, they're, they're, they've got plans in case of this mass slaughter. Luckily, I talked to the um, Nebraska Pork Producers Association uh, representatives. They said, luckily, many of the packing plants have been able to get online or partially online. This other issue compounding on this is that a lot of these farmers also are, are grain farmers as well. We've had three years of, of bad prices and, and kind of hard economic times for some of these farmers because we've had floods recently, we've had severe weather, we've had prices for uh, grains that have gone down. It's a very difficult situation, putting a lot of emotional stress on these producers as well. And you can just hear it in their voices, you know, that, that they don't want to be a farmer that loses their 50, 100 year farm that goes under this, but they're worried that this might happen, you know, because they can't rebound of it. The other thing they really are concerned about is having to waste, you know, to kill their livestock, you know, needlessly and go to waste, especially when they see empty grocery shelves, the high price people are paying, the food lines that you're seeing, how much are we going to have to pay for our food in the future when all of this thing starts to break loose because we're going to have probably some shortages. That's why this is such kind of, it's really a huge issue for, for everybody out there and people should be paying attention to it. They are dumping all of their milk every day now for the rest of the week. That's 2,400 pounds producing about a quarter million pounds of milk every day just to be poured down the drain. I think customers knew that they couldn't find milk that they normally would in the stores. But I don't think the customers knew that there was this storm brewing with dairy farmers, especially in Wisconsin, until we started reporting about it. We've never seen anything like this. Um, they're extremely stressed. 
A lot of people assumed correctly that it was because so many people were rushing to the stores buying all those products. They didn't realize that there was actually a surplus of dairy products and that the farmers were actually dumping their milk at these Wisconsin dairy farms. In Wisconsin, about 90% of the milk that's produced on farms ends up on a truck and moves to a cheese plant. They have seen, with the closure of, of hundreds of thousands of restaurants and schools and universities and destinations, that food service market where we feed people through those channels is, is been put on pause around the country. You know Wisconsin as kind of like a cheese state. We have so much cheese here, and I think that's where all of the milk comes into play. In the end, these farmers didn't have all that time to wait. They just had to do something right then and there, and that was to dump the milk. It's delicious, nutritious milk. This would have been on a store shelf 24 hours from now, um, but it's not. It's a heartbreaking thing for that farmer and for so many other dairy farmers because that is just, it's, re it's quality product that they worked really hard to produce that they're just throwing away. We're putting all this work into it, um, all this pride, all this time, and we're just dumping it down the drain. Ryan Elby from Golden E Dairy Farm in West Bend, Wisconsin. He says that they, at the start of the month, started shipping the milk out again. And at this point, they're not dumping any more milk. Hunger Task Force and its donors to the rescue. The organization is now committing $1 million for its new Wisconsin Dairy Recovery Program. So far, everything's being shipped, so I'm sure he's pretty thankful for that. It was a win-win-win for everybody. It's a win for the farmers when they get finally get paid for their milk. It's a win for the producer who's bottling the milk and putting people to work, as well as the logistics people who are driving it around. And it's a win for hungry people. There is a lot less going into food service and restaurants. I'm in touch with a lot of different industries here, one of them being the Rice Commission, California Rice Commission, which represents uh, hundreds of growers across the state. And they had mentioned that their farmers were doing something that was kind of different and unique and using uh, techniques to stay ahead of the curve and use social distancing out in the field, naturally, if you will. Once you get inside the tractor for disinfectant, uh, start with steering wheel. On the tractor, all the facets of the tractor, from the steps that you get into the, into the cab, the whole wheel, all of the, um, the parts and components of the tractor, they took a, a lot of time, rigorous minutes, to, to wipe those things down. In addition, they do a social distancing thing where only one farmer is assigned to one tractor. Going from field to field or if somebody doesn't show up that day, but now, you know, it's looking like this is going to be the new normal. Farmers are feeling very much an integral part of the economy and of the uh, American economic fabric. Farmers, farm laborers, they're essential. It's trying to keep everybody safe and healthy so we can keep them employed, number one, as an essential business, and number two, get our, our rice crop planted. But what's interesting also is that their market has diminished dramatically because a lot of their rice goes to sushi restaurants in California and elsewhere. And because a lot of those restaurants have been closed down, they don't have a marketplace for that. The other part of it is that if they supply rice for schools, schools have been closed down as well. So it's made a very big dent on their economic bottom line. California rice contributes more than $5 billion to our economy each year and 25,000 jobs. We also are home to millions of birds and the environmental benefits are valued well into the billions of dollars as well. So they're hoping that in September they'll be able to harvest and they're banking on the fact that by that time things will loosen up a little bit. Things will, you know, when they harvest, be able to actually go to market in a much more diverse and widespread geographic area. By September, they could be a lot different than they do now. We see the end product when it comes home and we're eating it and enjoying it. We don't always think about how it got there. Seeing how it's made and how it's grown and how it's harvested is always sort of an eye opener for me and the dedication and the love of the land that people have there. It's just a lot to milk goats in the morning and make products somewhere in between milk goats at night and then some point during the day pack like 15 orders to go out. The dairy industry is huge in Vermont. That's one of the things that we're known for besides maple syrup. Their entire production line changed in the matter of 24 hours once stay-at-home orders started really setting in and restaurants started really closing down. Their day-to-day -day operations look very, very different now than what they were before. We've been selling over our website for probably 10 to 15 years. 
Blue Ledge Farm has been around for more than 20 years. They have an established website, but the online orders were never something that they ever focused on. It was never a focus, not just because of, they didn't want to, but because there wasn't really a need for it. They were only getting a couple orders a week or a couple orders a month. And so they were mostly distributing to restaurants in the area. She really is relying on these online sales to get them through this time of, of it not being so busy on their distribution end. She was recruiting help from her teenage kids while they were out of school. So they would, you know, do some homework throughout the day, but they would be helping her package the uh, cheese up. This is how she's finishing up her high school career. She loves wrapping them like a little present. Same goes for Ice House. They are shipping out a ton, way more sales than they thought they would have. And now that farmers markets are open in a limited capacity, I think they're starting to balance out the in-person sales versus online sales. But I, I think there still is definitely a focus on the online sales for both of them. <laughs> He's been sitting in my lap, sorry. They are still a small scale farm. They're still trying to develop, but this really pushed them maybe two years into the future. But they also have to think about how can I ship this and packaging all of those different orders up throughout the day one of the farmers was saying that she had gotten maybe one or two online orders a week before this, or maybe even a month before this. And it all of a sudden was, you know, 40 to 50 orders. And that's a huge production change for them. It's more like the squeaky wheel gets the grease kind of thing. <laughs> uh, that website, it was just squeaking loud enough, huh? It's been good to force us into some things that we wanted to do, but we're low on the totem pole. So as, as difficult as this time is for a lot of these farms, and like I said, the amount of work that they're taking on is incredible. You know, they're also trying to find a silver lining as well of saying, hey, we never got to focus on our website before. We had a plan to do this maybe a couple years down the line, but we need to do this right now. Blue Ledge actually has its own farm stand I mentioned in the story, and they said that they've been getting a lot of business from there as well, where people can just drive up and it's an honor system where you can pick up whatever you want from their stand and you just put money in, in a bucket or an envelope or something, and then you can leave. So it's a no contact business, similar to online where you're not in contact with anybody, but that one at least is in person. And so it was a really nice reminder for her of why she got into the business to begin with. And she thinks it will change the future of their business. She thinks their business will steer more locally instead of the big distribution like they were originally thinking about. We kind of had lost touch with that a little bit, that direct consumer relationship. And it's been really nice to be reminded of that.